forged secretly in mortuary archaeology's hottest furnace. It's Archeo Death. Hello everybody. Welcome to this Archeo Death Live. I'll be starting in a few minutes once people start arriving and hopefully um, we can have a nice chat about all things archaeo deathly but uh oh hello a spiritual squirrel box hello rabbi hannah thank you very much for joining me let's hope they get some more people coming in i've got my got my sutton who t-shirt i've got my sir Abbas mug there just uh, gratuitously being dorsetian and uh I've got some wine as backup when the tea is gone. I've got brandy for when the wine is gone. I've got everything here for a life that could last forever. You know, I could be set in for the new millennium here. Or maybe it's just a 20 minute chat. Let's just see how this goes. So, what can I tell you about in the world of Arcudeth? Firstly, I'm going to do my usual rap, rab, rab, rabble, blab, blabble, burble on. And then hopefully afterwards um, we can have a chat with anyone who wants to have a chat, come up and have a chat or um, has any questions for me. But the main thing is we've got the scarf, the Doctor Who scarf here. I've got my a mortuary hat, got my Jamunbu helmet, got my pork pie hippie hat there. Got some books in the background. Oh, look, it's Grogu. There he is. Yeah, he's keeping me company. He's always on the lookout for for things. Uh, you know, it's all it's all it's going to happen. It's all happening. It's everything set. So the first thing to say is um, thank you very much. Uh, I've got 43,000 plus followers now and I'm approaching half a million likes, whatever that might mean. But that seems like a milestone in itself. But hello, everybody. Oh, hi, Alistair. Good to see you. And um, it's a really nice moment to be on here. Um, a couple more months and I'll be three years on this Godforsaken app. And uh, it's annoying, but great in the same time. Um, a lot has been going on, actually, as you know. Uh, um, there's been a lot going on and I want to address some of the things and updates of what's going on in, in my archaeo, archaeo death world. Um, but then equally, a lot is on hold because, as you may know, I've been participating in university and college union strike action. And we put together, uh, well, the union nationally went on 18 days of strike action through February and March. And we got through six of it, uh, which was is going to be financially crippling in itself. And a lot of work, a lot of uh, a lot of I'm on the committee for my branch at the University of Chester. And it was a lot of work to mobilize people, to organize people. We had three days of a physical picket, one of the first of which coincided with a national day of action with teachers. We rallied and marched in Chester with teachers and with nurses and with other public sector workers really good vibe um and then we did three days of digital uh strike action you know digital picketing but one of those days i went down to Glyndor, my local university in Wrexham, and helped them with their picket physically so and that has really affected me it's 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 I ha it's one thing to say it's not just a loss of pay and the work involved in mobilizing the protests but this is stressful it's exhausting it's mentally taxing and it leaves you feeling well i've been, i felt absolutely exhausted like I don't think I've felt this exhausted in a long time in academia and um, people think striking is a day off it's not not only am I losing the pay but I'm I've, each day I put in about 10-12 hours on social media trying to promote the cause and promote um, what we're doing creating videos creating posts for the yeah and it's been really stressful because not everyone agrees with the stance of the union and dealing with the public most of who are supportive but particularly dealing with colleagues who perhaps don't quite see it, the, the point that's been really hard so but the good news is and this is where we're going with this because after six days of strike action negotiations via ACAS have started with the employers and they've paused the strike action for two weeks we haven't won anything we haven't agreed anything but they've got a ACAS have identified a provisional timetable for two weeks of intense negotiations with the union to try and sort the shit out on the pensions issue, which affects some of the other universities, but not ours, on workloads, on uh, race and gender inequality with pay. Um, I think also disability pay, but they didn't mention that in the latest announcement. Um, can, uh, precarity of work. They're looking to end, they're hoping to end zero hours contracts at universities and perhaps push in other directions towards um, ending precarity, short term contracts. 
the pay offer is shit um, and it's not going to get any better. So I think we've got to write that off. But at least they've agreed to a better pay offer than they had on the table if we hadn't gone on strike action. So we're not going to get much money out of this, but we've at least pushed on some of the other issues. And so I've, I'm relieved. Uh, we heard yes um, on Friday night that, that we're having a two week pause, which means that the seven days of strikes planned for next week and the week after are not going ahead. Some of my more militant colleagues are furious and think that this is a sellout and a cop out. And they I think they are deeply misunderstanding what it means. It doesn't mean we're taking the eye off the ball. It doesn't mean that the strike is resolved. It doesn't mean that the negotiations don't con continue and we've still got the threat of further strike action if they piss us around so it doesn't we're not losing anything we're just but in terms of support at a branch level it does mean that across you know i'm an archaeologist but across all the disciplines we have two weeks to take stock try and get some energy back and while the negotiations are ongoing so from my point of view um yeah and the fact that acas are involved as you say rightly here you know it means the world because you've got to appreciate a couple of weeks ago we were trying to have a our negotiators were trying to meet with the employers and they were poo-pooing them and literally saying, we'll only meet you if you agree to call off all strikes or you're mocking us saying, oh, your offer is an April Fool's joke. So we now with ACAS, it's, it, it, the adults have entered the room type to manage the employers and make them sit down and deal with us. And it's starting to move in a good direction. So I, I, know, I know this is about academia and not everyone cares, uh, but I think it's important that this is... This is part of the pushback against a government and a culture and a, a cost of living crisis. So our victory is everyone's victory. And like nurses in Wales are going back on strike. You know, if, if we can all start to push together, then we can start to, you know, help each other. And it helps the private sector, too. So if you're not in the public sector, all of this doesn't do any harm. It's not taking money and rights away from anyone else. It all helps to build a better culture, given how unions have been attacked and undermined in this country, how... Um, you know, the, the, the crisis we're all facing in terms of uh, you know, cost of living and so on. So it's only good that we're making a stand, but it's amazing how how people will find a way to see the negative out of this. And I, I, I'm, I'm a pessimist at heart, but it's really good news. Uh, I just want to share that. That was my first thing I wanted to share with you, that the last few weeks have been bloody hard, but um, in a good cause, I think, as a branch, we pulled together um, Chester's a really small university compared with some of the big hitters in the game and the fact we've been able to put together three effective physical pickets and some really sort of visible digital sort of protests including students um, I did a, a, a TikTok live that went onto YouTube um, last week you know just saying explaining with a postgraduate student Ellie you know postgraduate researcher Ellie was able to sort of give her take on things and I think that was really important to get the message out there so, yeah, my God, it's been hard work. Upon, uh, uh, alongside that, I've been trying to find time to do my job. And the thing is, you know, as you can appreciate with an academic and like many jobs where you're your own master in many ways, by striking, I'm just creating a, a bigger workload for myself. So my, my work is stacking up, my marking. I've been doing some of the teaching, but striking through some of it. But also I've got editing to do on my edited book project on cremation in the early Middle Ages, Offers Dyke Journal 5, the open access peer reviewed journal I'm doing. I'm still doing work on that, but there's a lot of work piling up. Um, yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of videos, as you've seen. I'll, I'll, I'm visiting Stoke, uh, Stoke Museum, Pot the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery, uh, where I went to see the Staffordshire Hoard, which has been redisplayed. So I'm starting to share some of the, um, those posts about the, and also the amazing Spitfire exhibition. You know, you'll see more posts from the Potteries Museum in Staffordshire, Stoke on Trent uh, coming out very soon. And the Museum of Liverpool, where a couple of weeks ago I managed to spend a couple of hours and I managed to already create about 10 TikToks out of that. So I'm going to keep going with that. Uh, you know, you know, I've been talking about Viking archaeology again and discussing um, hate symbols and their, their, their misuse and use in, in, um, in, 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 uh, in various different contexts. And I have still owe oh, you guys a load of TikToks on themes I haven't quite got to. So I know that I still owe you um, TikToks on the new stable isotope evidence from Heathwood Ingleby, from Roman decapitation news, uh, um, evidence of more decapitated Roman burials. I still promise you a post on Jim Lingville, this uh, rather interesting artist from Denmark um, that, who has been promoting different visions of the viking age including face paint and that's where a lot of the misunderstandings are coming from is misunderstanding his art and thinking he's got some kind of tapped into ancestral knowledge 
about the Viking Age. Um, I still want to do a post about the TV show Vikings and how it's influenced how we think the Vikings wore face paint. Um, where I think the Vikings TV show is actually quite guilty in some ways, but actually doesn't do a lot of the things that people are up in arms about. You know, then they. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, and I want to do a post about Gamla Uppsala because we've got new evidence from the sort of great pagan temple site of the Viking Age in, of the Sphere in, in, in central Sweden, near modern Uppsala, the you know, second city or third city of um, Sweden. Certainly Malmo, Stockholm, Uppsala, third in size. I don't know the size, but, you know, it's one of the biggest cities. But next to it is Old Amp Uppsala, which is the site of the great Vendel period, burial mounds, pagan central place, uh, cult centre, and also uh, then the first bishopric, Christianised site of Sweden. So I've been pulling together evidence for a post on that. I've got a book post. I want to go back to the Eckstenstein and explain more about the archaeology of the Eckstenstein. And I want to talk about coffins and all sorts of other things that people ask me about by direct message. So I promise you I've got some really exciting posts coming up about all manner of early medieval archaeology and its relationship with the present. And also, I want to tell you about one other thing that's going on in my life. I have been, I, I, my Archaeodeath WordPress blog was, is where it all started, right? So I've got this WordPress blog. And in the heyday, I was pushing out 20, 25 posts a month, which is mad. Almost every day I was blogging. Um, and I've, cut, I've toned that down because of all the industrial action. I've realised I'm not doing that anymore. And so a year and a half ago, I pulled it down. Oh no, two, two and a half years ago, I pulled it down to about 10 posts per month. And uh, a year and a half ago, I pulled it down to five posts a month. And I've... It's difficult to keep going with the blogging, but it's a different medium from video. And I want to keep it as part of the Archaeodeath online. And I've just finished and posted my Archaeodeath review of Vikings Valhalla Season 1, which came out this time last year, which is the spin-off series by Jeb Stewart from the Michael Hurst series Vikings. So Vikings was six series. Uh, Vikings Valhalla jumps a century to the early 11th century. So it's like jump a century, about 120, 20, 130 years. And is crudely telling a fictional, fantastical version of um, the Scandinavian world from 1002 to 1066, right? And they've, I think they've got four or five seasons planned. And they've just released season two. But I did a blog post reviewing the Archeo death in season one, including a boat burning funeral, you know, on the Thames. Um, so I've, I, I've, I've just produced that, which was actually quite, quite complicated to do. But I'm glad I waited a year. And I'll tell you why. Because I've just also done the blog post for reviewing season two which is just out and there's things in season two that help me understand the logic or illogic of some of their decisions in season one in how they're portraying the the vikings in the early 11th century so um just so you know if you're into just not listening to videos but you want to read my blog obviously you've got over a thousand whatever who, how many who, who knows posts uh, blog posts to look through but I'm producing new ones every month. So five this month. And the first one is Viking Valhalla season one. Second one's going to be Viking Valhalla season two. I'm going to do a Witcher archaeology blog post, which I might do some videos on. I'm going to do a Vinland saga season two, because I've started watching Vinland saga season two. So you'll see some, some of that stuff coming out. So mortuary archaeology and pop culture, but I'll also be doing videos on new discoveries and new ideas and anything anyone asks me. I also owe people a TikTok on... Um, the Dawn of Everything book um, by uh, David Graeber and um, the other dude, Wengro. Um, and I promise to do at least one or two posts on that. So uh, those are some of the things I wanted to give you as an update. So thank you for 43,000. Thank you for following me. Thanks for the input. Thanks for supporting my Doctor Who uh, lives with uh, the Rebel Rabbi. Uh, which have been fantastic and we're going to have another one of those lives coming up soon on season nine with Peter Capaldi the first Peter Capaldi season season eight sorry season eight Peter Capaldi um and that's I've got back whichever is the first one with Peter Capaldi that's the one we're doing next so that's coming up but that's really my updates other than I'm shattered from the strikes I had a splitting headache yesterday that I think was stress related but I've got tea today and I'm going to answer some of your questions and I'm going to see what people said. The first thing I see saw as I was going through, someone asked me about this T-shirt. So this is, I bought this at the Sutton Hoo Visitor Centre, National Trust Visitor Centre. Um, and it's a, a T-shirt of uh, one of the press blesh scenes from the the helmet from Man 1 at Sutton Hoo. And it's a motif we found across Europe, Northern Europe. And it's been interpreted in different ways, but it represents basically two combating warriors fixed in a 
in a position of stalemate or self-destruct or mutual self-destruction right so you would think the rider is the winner here right he's got a spear he's got his horse he's riding down this 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 guy here and he's got a little spirit helper or helping guide his spear which may be a representation of a god or spirit or something but if you also look at the other guy this this chain mail figure is is stabbed the horse so the horse is going down so there's an argument about whether this scene is supposed to show a victorious like Roman cavalrymen, you know, and inspired inspired by Roman cavalry scenes on tombstones of Roman cavalrymen riding down the barbarian. But I think not. And there's been discussions. That actually, this is a much more. There was a tactic used against um, cavalry of, or at least of horse riders, of um, of stabbing the horses underneath. And is that trying to evoke that sense, or is it a scene from a particular myth or story? We don't know. But it's found on the helmet at Sutton Hoo. And uh, how we interpret the scene on the Sutton Hoo helmets, oh, there's a whole lecture I could give you about that. And I've written a research paper about that, where I sort of have a uh, slightly different take on the art of the Sutton Hoo helmet from certain other academics, such as Neil Price and uh, Paul Mortimer. But anyway, that aside, it's a really fantastic, iconic image from the early 7th century ship burial from Man 1 at Sutton Hoo, but on a helmet that was probably manufactured somewhere in Denmark or southern Sweden in the late 6th century so it's it's the the helmet from Sutton who the iconic Anglo-Saxon helmet is actually southern Scandinavian pre-Viking so that's that's answering that question um and the the blessing of the the t shirt is it's iconic and doesn't have any writing and therefore you can see it um you you can see it with with a uh, um without any text back to front uh, but the other problem is that it makes it very difficult to read your comments but let me just see if there's any other questions um but do ask me any questions, anything you want to, anything linked to any of my, uh, oh, hello. Um, and any, so I'm just saying hello to various people I can see. That doesn't make anyone sense. Um, um, and I will try and answer. So I've got a really good question here from Coral. Uh, thank you again. I answered one of your other great questions. You, you asked me really difficult questions, but in a good way. Thank you. Um, hang, hi Coral. Um, is TikTok recognised as part of your uni job? Is it public knowledge exchange for your bosses? Now that's a really interesting question. At one level, you would think so, wouldn't you? And at one level, I treat it in a semi-professional way. I, I do silly posts, I do jokey posts, I do I say things that perhaps I wouldn't say if it was a corporate official presentation. I'm not just doing a, hey, would you like to know about the Vikings? This is an artifact to be found in a... I'm not doing that. I'm doing a few posts like that, but I'm trying to be me, right? So at one level, I'm not trying to be over-professional with this and no one's recognising it. I'm not getting any money, credit, time from my university to do it. Um, another level, I do see it as inherent in my job as a public academic, as someone who... A public intellectual makes me sound cleverer than I am, but a person who is trying to share their expertise with a broader audience. And I think when I started doing my blog in 2013, I, I started thinking, should I go into video... The pandemic made me go into video 2020. Whether it, I get two followers or 2,000 or 200,000 is less important for me than this being a, a conduit of extending my research uh, to audiences beyond the academy. And given that, frankly, and I don't want to, I don't want to make myself sound like I'm some kind of innovator. People have been saying this for a long time, that most audiences for academic work in archaeology are white British middle class, you know, or white American middle class, you know, or the equivalent around the Western world. They're, they're very white, very privileged, very knowledgeable. They're already reading the books. If they're coming to a public lecture, they're already of a particular background. They've got the leisure time or they've got the interest to study the past, right? Going to heritage sites, going to museums, right? And we're trying to think of, we're always talking about, well, new ways to break this down. Or oh, I've made my research paper open access, therefore everyone will suddenly be able to read it. Will they, hell? You know, but yeah, that's one route. I'm not dismissing it tightly, but TikTok seems an obvious place, given the, the level of interactivity. And I was encouraged to do this by a doctoral researcher at the University of Manchester, Kat Flegel, who um, um, is got an account on here, but she has she's deleted all her posts. She's a bit more timid, um, and I think she got a lot of pushback for her posts and a lot of weird attention from men but so she's actually deleted but she encouraged me first of all to take up the idea of doing this 
and I've got a lot of time and respect and um, admiration for her because she really put me in the right direction of something I think is really, really beneficial and extends what I was doing already. But, you know, I wasn't really sure it would work. And then after a few years, I thought I would have thought, given you know, my university would be interested in this. And they're not really. <laughs> so one level, you're getting something quite honest and clear and no strings attached. I'm not trying to sell you a university course, although I've done a few posts about my university and promotion, but only really as an occasional thing. I'm not trying to sell you uh, an archaeological truth. I'm not trying to peddle a religion or a peddle a, um, a vision. I'm not trying to create a cult following for my work only. I do share my ideas. I'm not just sharing the archaeology news. I'm sharing my work and my concepts and my visits and my sites and monuments. I so you're getting something quite raw, but um, and, and the, it's obviously got my agenda as my interest, but it's not I'm not trying to push a particular thing. So at one level, it is part of my job. It's integral to what I do um, and I can rationalise it and I can contextualise it. Another level linked to given the strike action and so on, I've been having second thoughts about whether I should be doing this at all. Is it breaking the digital picket? I certainly haven't been doing posts on the, the strike days. But, you know, is this part of should I be doing any of it, given how badly some of my colleagues are being treated? Well, all of us are being treated. So I, um, I don't know if that answers your question, Coral, but I think it's a great question. And uh, one where at least I would not welcome any control from my employers as an academic in the UK. I have auto autonomy to decide how to do my research and I. At one level, I would almost, I'm glad that I don't have a formal recognition for it. Another level, it's irksome that it's not given any credit. And there are other younger academics on here without permanent jobs who, and I talked about this in a, in a YouTube video, a seminar that turned into a YouTube video with Ellie Mackin Roberts, you can find on my Archeo Death YouTube. We talk about how she's doing such great innovative work, sharing good information about ancient Greece, art and religion and she hasn't got a permanent job and for her and for other younger academics they're trying to make their name through TikTok not instead of doing good academic research but to build on their academic expertise I don't need it in that way and you can take what you will from that whether that's good or bad I'm certainly lucky that I don't need it because there's no way I'm going to make a career money out of this or you know uh, but on another level it's um, a little frustrating there's not the the academic credit. And I think I've said before, but I said it in a TikTok when someone asked me what I think about Dr. Jackson Crawford. And I said, well, in my view, he is a failure and he's not, he, he represents a failure. He's not a failure. He represents a failure. He represents a failure of the U US and the broader Western academic tradition that he, the only way he could do successfully what he's doing on YouTube is by giving up his academic job, which he was never given a permanent position with in. So in many ways, Jackson, in my view, is not a failure. He's, he's a great success of public education, but he represents a failure of our system. That The only way you can do that is by giving up on an academic career, which is poor. And that says a lot about our shitty world of neoliberal universities. I could rant on, but I hope that's enough. I've gotten lifted and I thought I was channeling ancient spirits. I've no idea what that means, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I probably that's a comment in relation to what what I was saying. Was that about the shirt? OK, that's cool. Have you heard of Crump's Caskets? No, I haven't. You'll look that up now on the Internet while I babble on. I've heard of Crump's Caskets. I don't know if that's aimed at me, but I'm going to look up what that is. There's always something I don't know about. What the heck are these? Oh, a, a funeral director. Oh, I'll have a look at I'll have a look at that Crump and Sons. It comes up is the first thing that comes up. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but that I'll have a look. Yeah, there's all sorts of new only cast. Oh, sorry, no, no, that's something else. Only caskets ever found of indigenous people in North America. Oh no, I don't know anything about this. No, I'll look this up about in um, uh, Blount County. Um, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Um, you know, the interesting point about I don't know how this the context of this still can't give forgive Dublin for building over a Viking burial site. Well, I mean, 
when they I mean I don't know when the earliest construction of that was but I mean if you're talking about the railway line uh, Island Bridge and Kilmainham and most of that was 19th century wasn't it so it's major most of it was navvies actually digging through and discovering this cemetery during the building of the railway line to Houston station so you've got Dublin and it's it's ra railways actually is a blessing and a curse because an archaeological discovery is a destruction and we don't know about it until it's being destroyed but you've got to appreciate the railway network in Britain and Ireland um, resulted in some of the most amazing archaeological discoveries for a first really a first and second generation of archaeological research in the 19th century so it's a very much a blessing and a curse that that work was discovered. The Kilmainham and Island Bridge, great Viking burial site. The artifacts are amazing. And if it had been excavated properly, it would be amazing. But it was excavated. There was no proper recording of graves. So we've got the artifacts. We don't know how many graves went with those artifacts. It's a real dog's dinner. It's a real mess. Sites like that, if they were dug in modern conditions in the 21st century, would be a dream. Because that cemetery, if that cemetery was excavated now, we'd be able to get all the DNA, all the stable isotopes, all of the burial positions, evidence of all of the ways the objects were treated. They would probably have found many more organic objects that we wouldn't, wouldn't have been spotted in the 19th century. Bits of horn, antler, bone, leather, textile. Oh, it would be a dream. It would cost millions of pounds or millions of euros to, you know, probably tens of hundreds of millions of euros to excavate, but it would be a, it would give us the detail of knowledge of that Viking community from the 9th century through to the 11th century. Wow, what a, or at least the early phases. So yeah, um, there's so much, early archaeology is a nightmare because you see, wow, this exciting site and everyone talks about these exciting sites, be it you know, talking about, you know, the, the, the excavation of Knossos in Crete or the excavation of these sites in the Moundville site, you know, the Mississippi Valley civilizations. And then you realise how badly they were excavated and how much more we could know if they were excavated in modern times. And you think, oh, it's like how much it's like they, they basically are pissing away data, spaffing away archaeological research. But then, of course, we know about these sites, but we know how much they we also know how much we don't know because we can imagine how they destroyed them. OK, so these crumped caskets things, are, I, I, I'm going to look up, OK, mate? I, I haven't I know anything about that, but I shall look. I shall promise I'll look that up. If I'm, Oh, someone else has finished Vikings Valhalla Season 2. Did you like it? I haven't said whether I liked it or not. AV Pretty Kitty says, um, just finished Vikings Valhalla Season 2. I don't know what I think about these two series, these spin-off series in the 11th century. I like some of the actors. I must say I have a slight crush on Queen Emma, but then, you know... And any any queen that horribly tortures people to death has got to get your attention, you know. And Godwin's cool. He's a, he's a he's a wily old hound, isn't he? And uh, but some of the other characters are a bit, you know, Leaf and Harold are a bit a bit knobs, aren't they? Really. And I don't know Freydis is not a Lagatha, is she? You know, she. I don't know. Um, Marion was a good character, the uh, Arab astronomer. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to make of. Who is Kaiser Soze? This is the question. This is the, this is the question. Who is Kaiser Soze? We will never know. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's an in joke. I think. I think we'll just leave it there, shall we, with the, the Kaiser Soze? But I will be. I mean, I um, the whole. Um, I, I think there's a general sense that maybe I will enact my Rowengi on everybody I know and their families and their family's fans and so on. Pete Pothelswaite accent, which always ends up sounding slightly Indian and maybe a bit Welsh. <laughs> ah, yes, you do ask me every time. How significant a burial price is for quality cross-cultural inferences? I mean, yes, this is a really big... Ask. Oh, God, you're right. OK, Forest Dump 13, you want a big, you want a big question to answer. Right, so um, mortuary archaeology is the study of human remains, of, of past and present... Uh, death ways, manners of dealing with the dying, disposing of the dead, commemorating the dead um, through their material culture, through the spaces of death, the built environments of death and the landscapes of death. So we're looking at that's what archaeology is. And when the subdiscipline of mortuary archaeology is trying to look at all of the attitudes and relationships, practices and beliefs surrounding death from the archaeological record. And we deal with a variety of different evidence types from cemeteries containing skeletons to cremations, uh, cremation burials, 
through to elaborate monuments uh, raised for the dead and so on. And I, I, there's been a whole debate about to what extent is there a fixed human set of behaviours that we can understand, you know, that humans deal with death, they dispose of the dead. And there's been debates about how well how far back can we go with this? When were the first formal burials? And we we think we've got formal burials from the Neanderthals. There's a debate about whether we have various other hominin species may have also disposed of the dead. But you know, the fact is in the modern Homo sapiens sapiens, as spread across the world, we have evidence of funerary practices going back at least forty five thousand years, you know, since the, the that, that spread process, you know, that that global global presence as you know as older than that but you know since that time and the question is you know you know are the treatments of the dead representing some universal about us or not and at one level i i dance this game between universal cross correlation um where we can draw on you know both our own society and uh indigenous communities who have preserved their traditional ways of disposing of the dead and we can see broader par parallels and in the 60s and 70s particularly British and American archaeologists were all for looking at this big modelling of burial data so that you can sort of go, you know, the variables in the treatment of the dead match on to social complexity, particularly, and economic um, subsistence systems and structures. So, you know, very simple hunter-gatherer societies should not do much with the dead other than dispose them, right? Whereas elaborate, you know, complex technological systems and uh, social systems with hierarchies and kinship-based structures and class-based structures and elites should have really complex various funerary practices and massive monuments and that we you know particularly when we're looking at early societies when we see the rise of monumentality we should see the rise of social hierarchy social complexity and then we find all the reasons why that doesn't work <laughs> and then we realize that actually we've got some really elaborate burials from the upper paleolithic what does that tell us is, were those societies more complex than we thought, or are we misunderstanding what elaborate treatments of the dead might mean? So there's a whole. That's this is one of the key questions of my entire career. Is you know to what extent can we make parallels from the modern times and our modern treatments of the dead and other non non Western traditional societies, if you like, um, unaffected by or at least partially affected by world systems of religion, religious systems. And use them to understand the human past, or is that leading us down a dead end? Should we actually try and treat past societies on their own merits rather than try and fit them into our expectations, our models? And particularly, this is where one of the big tensions I have with American archaeologists who have in the past gone for big cross cultural generalizations, you know, based on small samples of ethnographic data acquired in the 19th and 20th centuries, versus a more British historical contextual approach that's very much about trying to understand this particular society in this place in this times attitudes and just practices surrounding death and not trying to make broad cross-cultural parallels so i haven't answered your question but i've set up the problem <laughs> uh, so like how how legit is it to say burial practices lichens groups lichens groups like lichens i don't i i mean how do how do the burial practice link to particular groups oh, well that i mean this is one of the other great questions is are when we look at the funerary record, when we see a particular mode of disposal, is it because there was an ethnic or cultural group that called themselves X and buried the dead? We are Vikings or we are Saxons or we are heralds or we are, you know, we are Huns and we all bury the dead this way. This is our tradition. Or was there actually much more flexibility within and between communities? And I think that's the what we see nowadays in archaeological research is there's no ethnically explicit singular form of disposal method. And that's one of the reasons why I'm quite kind to TV shows like Vikings, because they draw on archaeological evidence. And if one thing that's that while there's a lot of fantastical death rituals in that TV show, what they do show is a variety of different ways in which people dispose of the dead in the same society at the same point of time and who died in different circumstances. And that is actually what a lot of mortuary archaeology is showing us, that there's different age, gender, um, circumstances of death, social status in death. Are reflected in the disposal methods so i think there is no single correlation of to be cremated in this period you must have been of this one faith you look at our society look at the uk at least where cremation has it is one of the burial rites i'm particularly interested in. cremation has strong atheistical and um, utilitarian and um, medical legal dimensions to it it also is favored by some particular religious minorities in the uk ethnic minorities 
uh, with particular religions, particularly Sikhs and Hindus and to some extent Buddhists too. But it's and it's also favoured by some pagan groups. Um, but it also is now widely adopted by Christians of different varieties and only perhaps you know, Jews, Orthodox Jews, um, more Orthodox uh, Islamic groups um, and Roman Catholic groups where um, cremation has been legal by the, uh, in the legalised by the Catholic Church, sanctioned by the, not legalised, sanctioned by the Catholic Church since the 60s. But there's still a tendency not to cremate. So, you know, apart from those groups, actually almost everyone cremates. And so you can't say, oh, they're cremating because they're Sikh. Or, no, it's, it's more, this is the tradition and this is part of a range of groups who prefer this. And you'll still find people who don't get cremated for a variety of circumstances and reasons. Or you'll find people who say they don't want to be cremated or do want to be cremated and they don't get what they want because of family circumstances. Um, you know, there's a whole series of interesting things uh, about disposal disposal of the um disposal of the you know dead and religion and ethnicity and yes sometimes death ways can be a way of expressing your ethnic identity to make you different to articulate your difference not just simply where and how you'd bury the dead but how you treat the the living the mourners and the ceremonies you know and in other contexts i think you're looking at uh you know death rituals are actually sharing a lot of similarities across uh, a, a community and this is where religious and ethnic minorities are often invisible in the archaeological record. It's not because archaeologists, well, sometimes it's because archaeologists are biased and don't look. But sometimes it's because you, you may have been a practicing Jew in the 7th century in England. But unless you've got a community of Jews who want to bury you in a distinctive fashion, according to Jew Jewish pra practice, in death, sadly, you're not going to look different from anybody else. And likewise, with a lot of other or, you know, if, if there's, you know, the difference between... Um, you know, people of Protestant and Catholic faith in the 17th century. Yes, there will be differences of burial location, but it depends on where you're talking about and how you're talking about. And there'll be a lot of similarities in burial tradition and treatment. You can't always say, ah, buried like a Catholic, or buried like a Protestant. You know, it's not that simple. You know, so, you, you know, you see a lot of, they're all using the same economy, the same cultural fashions and styles of dress. So societies aren't these hermetically sealed cultural groups, and there's a lot of flow. Um, intended and it's a lot to do with control and management availability of sources and so on so I suppose what I'm getting at is that mortuary archaeology is a messy space because you're not dealing with what people wanted you what you're often dealing with what people could get or other people decided they were going to get and so you're never looking directly into people's minds and aspirations for their treatment in death and let alone what they were in life um, you're looking at a whole complex set of agents the mourners the dead person authorities uh, ritual specialists all who are bringing their contribution to the funeral i think that's answered i hope well i hope that's answered Th liking my shirt thank you oh here someone's given me an interesting question the mad realm that's a wonderful name for a tiktok account may i say the mad realm and the question is simple and thought structured thanks casket thoughts I have many thoughts about the Frank's casket. Now, if anyone doesn't know what that means, this is an amazing object. This is a 8th century whalebone casket now on display in the British Museum, which uh, probably was uh, a, a gift of kingly um, or high status ecclesiastical a gift. It's a highly crafted whalebone casket um, depicting a host of different scenes, um, which have been a focus of great interest, some of which are vaguely discernible. Um, it shows the, um, Romulus and Remus suckling the she-wolf, the sort of progenitors of Rome. It shows the, the sacking of Jerusalem by the Romans. It shows then also the adoration of the Magi, so the three kings coming to give gifts to the Christ child. And it also has some scenes that could only be described as from Germanic mythology, mainly because we don't know what the heck they are. And uh, the most famous scene, of course, is juxtaposed next to the adoration of the Magi is the, is the, is the representation of Wayland in his smithy giving a drink to the king's daughter, which is part of a deep time legend of the magical smith Wayland being crippled and imprisoned on an island to make precious gifts for the king. But he exacts his revenge on the daughter and sons by firstly killing the king's son, luring the king's sons with promise of treasures to his smithy and then dispatching them and turning different parts of them into jewels. 
um, and then drugging the king's daughter and via the way of things uh, ensuring that the king has a grandson not of his line via his daughter and in the the lay of volander which we have in the poetic edda which is much later the version of this story is or is very much like he, uh, wayland is an anti-hero that is reflecting on lordship and kingship and bad kingship bad kingship is despotic it is controlling and revenge will be sought on this kind of baddie so it's more like a wayland is a bit of a marv from sin city in fact so is most people in norse mythology a bit of a marv from sin city you know a bit unhinged a bit over violent does grisly and grisly things or um, a bit loki as well um and we don't know exactly the origins of the story but this frank's casket shows that the story of wayland was known in england in the 8th century and it's really the only source we have that early the proof that we have that early that later legend of wayland and that the scene juxtaposes wayland with the adoration of the magi and i suppose those two scenes are supposed to be seen in, in relation to each other because of course the magi are bringing gifts to the christ child and therefore they're honoring the ultimate lord in christian thinking the ultimate lord in and the model for christian kingship is christ as it as with everything else and the here are three you know wise men bringing ultimate gifts to honor the christ charles and then they're flipping this in a really dark way with the gift that wayland is giving to the the the, the uh the, the king's daughter is a gift of violent impregnation and you know seduction leading to the death of the death of the bloodline of the king in question so the Christ child is next to the scene, which is really quite chilling. It would be really quite horrible. And to a modern eye, you're like, what the heck? What the heck? You imagine we've seen, oh, look, lovely, lovely whalebone casket. What's it contain? Oh, the, the holy relic of St. Uh, Hardolf, uh, or whatever. Oh, lovely. Oh, look, there's there's the three kings, and there's Wayland the Smith. What the fuck? You know, it's not, it's not, it's supposed to be disconcerting. It's supposed to be terrifying. And it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be a lesson to kings about good kingship, bad kingship. You know, the Christ child, Wayland. And Wayland isn't the king. Wayland is the, the 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 revenge, the agent of revenge, on bad kingship. That's my take on it. Anyway, that's so. You asked me about the Frank's casket. That's my take on it. Lots of sites are suffering from gravity recently. Unfortunately, Eamon, that is one of the problems I've noticed about the twenty first century, and that you can trace back in time. Gravity. I don't know why it's just one of those things I mean relativity aside it's reasonably constant and I've noticed that the archaeological record tends to tends to involve gravity if you ever lifted soil from an archaeological site it weighs and then you have to transport it and the objects weigh things and it's it's a gravity is a bitch really for archaeology that's all I can say forgive my gender slur but it's a bitch thank you for that comment Yeah, if only we didn't have gravity, then we wouldn't have lots of things. I wouldn't like to do archaeology in, in zero gravity, actually. That'd be a bit of a nightmare. Can you imagine that? Imagine the mess. Imagine the LSAN toilets on site. Oh, no, zero gravity archaeology is no good. But I suppose it'd be easier. But you'd lose the stratigraphy as everything's floating around. There's lots to think on here. Is there any truth or possibility of truth in Graham Hancock's work? Uh, no. Graham Hancock's a failed journalist who's just spinning out bullshit. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, there's possibility in anything, isn't there? But if, you know, there's, there's more possibility that, uh, um, there's more, there's lots more plausible than Graham Hancock's things. There's lots of exciting new archaeological finds. We don't need to waste our time with Graham Hancock. It's, 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 a, it's, it's not. It's, I don't. I don't care. It's just a waste of time. He's, 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 you know, the thing is, um, people say, oh, well, you know, he's not, he never claims to be an archaeologist. No, he, but uh, even j journalists have uh, codes of ethics and they in investigate and interrogate value reliable sources and talk to experts in the field to gain their story. Hancock doesn't do that. That's why he's a failed journalist. Yeah, he's a Tucker Carlson of ancient aliens, isn't he? Or ap ancient apocalypse. Loser. Very rich loser. <laughs> mm. 
Shifting back to her, uh, thank you for your comments on responding to Valkyrie's Valhalla, that's always good. I also thought cremation was very utilitarian. Well, that's 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 a, that is that is what most people think. But actually, you can have you know outside of our modern Western societies, some of the most elaborate funerary ceremonies seem to have involved cremation in past societies. Um, and you know, I'm glad you're having those conversations, Alistair, about cremation versus burial, because I think we all have to make choices about our own modes of disposal, and we don't have a single template of what to do, whatever our religious backgrounds, or if we have no religious background. There's no single way forward. And that's why I think one of the merits of archaeology is, is teaching the mortuary archaeology is comforting and informative because it reminds us that there's never been a single way of death. There's never been a single mode in which people have to or should dispose of the dead. And it should liberate us to think about different ways in which we can and, 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 and should honour the dead or whether we do at all. And certainly that's been a thing for people in COVID who lost relatives and couldn't have a funeral and felt they let themselves down, let the dead down, let, you know, because of the pandemic. And um, there's been there's a lot of, you know, trauma, emotions and, un, un, you know, about pandemic funerals and also border crisis funerals. We saw the tragedy of the earthquake in Turkey recently. Um, and we have to think about, well, you know, how do people dispose of the dead in such exceptional circumstances? And there's that sense of loss and that takes it's a very different scenario from dealing with one when you're dealing with a thousand. And we've seen we see this in the archaeological record in mass disasters in the past. And I think we have to think about when social mores break down, when rules break down, you know, how do people cope with that level of loss? And I think a lot of people are realising with, as Amy says here about a lot of people are realising that, you know, we can just we don't have to do this. And this is what archaeology shows us. There's other ways. There's very elaborate ways we can dispose of the dead. But a lot of people in the past didn't get elaborate funerals because they didn't have the money or the time or the resources or they weren't allowed to. And that doesn't their humanity, their story needs, still needs to be told and respected. And a lot of archaeology is about telling those stories about people who never entered the historical record were not important or rich enough to ha be part of anyone's chronicle and there are a whole host as uh, as, as being said here of more uh, um, eco-friendly options for disposing of the dead and archaeology can inform us about that and ej yes uh, we've just been talking about this the danny pink episode in the nether sphere um Yes, so our latest uh, Doctor Who Live, uh, uh, the Rebel Rabbi and myself, have uh, put onto YouTube, on my Archaeodeath YouTube channel. Uh, but, but we talked about this episode, and uh, there's a lot of complaints about that episode of Danny Pink and the idea of the, the nether sphere where the cremated dead still are in agony from the burning of their bodies, which is a, you know, thanks to the, the Missy and her use of Gallifreyan hard drive technology, is, is actually creating an eternal afterlife torment for the, the souls of the dead including the cremated dead and those who gave their body to science, which is really a dark, one of the darkest and perhaps ill-considered um, storylines of Doctor Who. But actually, it really does bring up this broader... We, we discuss how it brought, brings out this broader sense that even in the most atheistical world, we still tie the fate of the soul to the fate of the body. And that plays with that idea that we still quite still think in terms that... Are, it does matter, even if you're completely atheistical, you don't believe there's any spirit or soul or vestige of the person left in that corpse. What happens to that corpse still matters. Very few people are so utterly, yeah, it doesn't matter. Just just catapult it onto the nearest refuse tip. No, it still matters. And so archaeologists have a job to do. To And one of the things that archaeologists do, particularly in the recent times, is is to restore lost bodies um you know to finding you know we see forensic context of archaeology of, of of restoring of finding the burial sites of murder victims but also genocide victims but then also restoring their story connecting through their their, their the traces of their bodies now increasingly with dna back to the families who have long lost those individuals that disappeared in argentina in the in the in the former yugoslavia um archaeology is pro providing that role in the Spanish Civil War victims, you know, of providing the role of connecting families who never found out where and how or if the bodies of their loved ones received a proper burial. 
Thank you for the compliments. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to keep spit. I'm going to go. Otherwise, I'm going to go back. And I wish I could show you the weight of Frank's casket. But this is the, the limitation of not being in my office with all my books here. I don't think I've got a Frank's casket image behind me. But anyway. Your mum's family are Hindu, Alistair. Yeah. So, you know, um, the Hindu traditions of cremation had to adapt for a British landscape using municipal crematoria. But there's been doesn't mean they lose their tradition because they've adapted it over the last four or five. Uh, how many generations? Uh, I, I don't know how I would like to speak with confidence how many generations you'd characterize, major, you know, major Hindu immigration into this country. Are we, would we say four? Um, Five gener I don't, generations confuse me. I never quite know what people mean by them. But, you know, we're looking at 70 years. Right. We also have a pre we have there's an archaeology of, of, of Sikh and Hindu cremation before um, the major immigrations from South Asia and from East Africa, because we have, for example, there were cremations during the First World War for Sikh and Hindu soldiers who died in hospitals in England who were fighting on the Western Front and who were cremated. So, for example, on the South Downs, there were crematorium sites uh, set up um, for visiting Nepalese dignitaries. There was a Nepalese princess who was cremated near Woking in about 1927 or something. No, 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 older than that, 1890-something. You know, there was cremation has been happening in the British landscape in recent times by South Asians um, long before mass migration in the post-Second World War era, right? But there's a story here about how immigrants always adapt. They adapt the way they live. They adapt the way they work. They adapt their language, culture. And it's not always about giving up. It's about adapting. And cremation is an interesting example of that. Uh, there's, there's been there's a book by Shirley Firth about Hindu cremation uh, practices and funeral practices. And, uh, and the, I think it's Shirley Firth. Um, looking at how, from a sociological point of view, how you know, second, third generation immigrants have dispose of the dead and how they link it back to their homeland or imagined homelands and the senses of death and disposal. So um, immigrant communities are always adapting their ways of de dealing with the dead and claiming they're traditional when often they're far removed from the traditional. That doesn't mean they're, they're not valid. It just It's just what migra migrant societies and communities have to do. Was Ertzi murdered or not? I mean, yeah, that's a really interesting one. I have only, I only dip into Earthsea archaeology because it's been a, such a wonderful journey of, thank you, Michael, for that question, of changing views on the Earthsea find. I thought the latest work was to suggest that he was, um, he did die of a hugely violent death, whether it was murder in the modern sense or some other form of killing. Yeah, died a violent death, I thought was the, I haven't looked, I, I'm speaking off the top of my head. I'm sure you can easily find out more by Wikipedia. So I won't say much more. But I think the Earthsea find is amazing how people have gone back and forth with different interpretations of this body found in you know, coming out of the ice, you know, and rich in tattoos and material culture. And from this argument that he died just walking in the in the Alps to, well, apart from all the evidence of violence under the corpse. And it's also a story of poor practice in terms of allowing his body to thaw out to some degree. And there's a whole ethical and political dimensions to the Ertzi story as well about who claimed him and how his story has been written. But I must admit, I'm not up on Ertzi. So I, I'm afraid I, ha I need to I need to um, I need to sort of pass that one by. But yeah, great question. Oh, yes. No soul. Yes. But I mean, we all feel tied to what happens to the body and have anxieties about it. And that links to Arctic Harmacist here, who, of course, we were discussing the upset and anxiety that what happens to the dead body is, is used almost as an insult, as a way of mocking people of a particular identity and, you know, um, to, you know, sort of imagine, well, in the future, we'll be able to know what you think. And we were talking about that issue. But yeah, so people, no matter how rational you may be and how scientific, you still think that there's something about we need to care for the dead, even if it's to just make them elsewhere, dispose of them, put them into other space. We don't just go, oh, you know. And in, all, in many societies, one of the few cross-cultural things is that in societal unrest and in disaster times, traditions of disposal break down. They don't always break down entirely, but they do change rapidly.
So in the absence of an afterlife, what are, what are remains but the focus of our cultural expression of grief? Yes. And I think that's the... Ah, you, you get there so ahead of me. You're so brighter than me. You know, you, yeah, this is the whole point, isn't it? Is If you don't believe in an afterlife, then the body actually doesn't become less important. It actually retains or enhances its importance. Um, and it becomes a focus of your social and cultural sort of attention. Forest funerals are a beautiful thing, yes. And we see woodland funerals have become, over the last 50 to 70 years, a, a real distinctive f phenomenon in the last, um, you know, in, in with not only municipal cemeteries having woodland components, but also separate private um, um, woodland um, businesses set up on farms so that you can be buried under a tree as a sort of eco-alternative. And I think that's a really, really clear and distinctive way of disposing of the dead. Yes, so I, I do agree that, that we can we can we can think of um, we can actually see this and I, so I've, I've I've supervised archaeological work by a master student brilliant piece of work looking at the archaeology of natural burial grounds the archaeology of um, the emergent new distinctive funerary spaces of fields meadows woodland dedicated to the commemoration of the dead um, and it is really distinctive because there's a lot of overlap and I've done a blog post about this if you're interested where we you can see um many of these sites have gone for a pure form of you know, we're gonna create a radically different eco space where it does look like a natural environment and others which end up looking very much like a traditional cemetery uh because they're buying into the same pressures and corporate spin and attempts to sell different plots and different styles of, of better grave um as we find in the traditional cemetery so actually that's a really interesting point about how um you know there's you, know, you can see the spectrum from those that want to actually advocate a very very different type of funerary environment to those that are trying to enwrap um you know co-ops natural burial grounds into the traditional business model of different plots and different scales and so on and that's really interesting because I mean one of the things I thought was really quite a romantic spin on natural burial grounds was the way obviously I don't think there's anything in Tolkien that says this happened but the way that the Rings of Power TV show represented the Linden Elves having a woodland burial ground or at least a, a woodland cenotaph uh, where each tree is carved with a memorial to the elf that died and I thought that was a really um um you know, I think that's a really distinctive way of reflecting on that tradition. Um, what's your strongest argument against mass migration? I have no idea, mate. I don't think I need to argue against mass migration. Forest funeral is a big thing. Yes, yeah, so I read that one. This one was in Mauritius. But even when, oh, sorry. I, I think I'm missing a comment there from Alistair. Let me just go back and find out. Um... I was interested in experiencing a Hindu funeral, says Alistair. Sorry, I, 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 didn't, uh, I, I didn't get that one. This was in Mauritius, and even then the tradition must have been, effect, been affected by... Yes, I mean, the Mauritian community, I don't know much about. I've, I've met Mauritian... Um, I don't know if they were a Hindu, but a, a, a Mauritian individual, an academic individual, and a very nice chap. But, but I, I, you know, I think, yes, I mean, it's not just one step, is it? You know, you've had South Asians moving around and... Um, um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not a single jump. And, you know, we have British Asians who came from East Africa and, you know, all over the show. So, yeah, it, it, these, com these communities are not going to have a single monolithic understanding. I meant to boat boning would be very cool as a way of saying it. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to, I've, actually, I was going to talk to you about... Um, um, Sorry, I was just distracted by the fact that I either someone else or I pinned a comment. I didn't know you could do that. That's very cool. Um, someone's talking about boat burning. Yeah, sorry, this is um, 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 Pretty Kitty saying about boat burning. Yeah, I've done some videos about that, you know, about how much we actually don't have any evidence that the Vikings did burn the dead in boats um, on water. But we do have evidence they're burning boats on land. So, yeah, but either way, it's pretty dramatic. And the boat provides a vehicle for evoking the afterlife journey in some way
<laughs> I have, I'd have to settle for some friends chucking me on a rich guy's yacht and setting me on fire. Well, actually, that is a scene from season three of Fear the Walking Dead, isn't it? Where, or is it season two? No, season three. Season three, where um, the boat gets cremated. Um, you know, the rich yacht, Abigail, which, of course, is named after um, the lover of Strand. And so it's almost like cremating his memory. So I talk about that in a blog post as well, about funerary cremations as cenotaphs of uh, memorialising the dead of, of ships. You see, the thing about, OK, Arctic Harmacist, I don't know much about natural burial, but my sense is that a lot of natural burial grounds are not very eco-friendly. Um, um, and they're not really, and um, some of them are planned better than others to actually be viable forests. And I think you'd have to talk to a forest, a forest, uh, forestician, forestologist, uh, whatever you call, arbor, arbory, uh, whatever you call, per, people who work with plants, probably you. Uh, but um, the fact remains, I don't think a lot of these natural burial grounds are particularly natural at all. And in fact, many uh, historic gardens are probably much more natural spaces than, than many of these, uh, these other kinds of environment. Oh, sorry, just to say, my T-shirt is the press splash plaque from the Sutton Who Mound 1 helmet of two warriors in combat with a third little miniature character helping the, the horse-backed warrior. So it's from the Sutton Who, mate. Oh, crazy, non-crazy cat lady, non-crazy, crazy cat lady. Good evening, everybody, she says. And thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I think it's really interesting to see the... Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still going through the T-shirts. I'm still going through the T-shirts. Woodland ecologist was the term I was thinking of. Yes, uh, that's what I was thinking of. Or arborist. Yes, these are the terms I was thinking of. I often don't get the right words. But for me, natural burial grounds are really interesting. There's one near me, uh, Mayfields. I've done a blog about it. Surprise, surprise. I don't think they knew I did a blog about it. But it's it's really interesting. But it's 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 not very old and it looks very empty. And they've got lots of different options of how you can you can have, you plant, have a tree planted over you. You can have your ashes scattered at a tree. You can have almost like traditional grave style plots, but with a tree in the middle. And it's basically a grave with a tree. So there's lots of different relationships between inhumed bodies, cremated bodies and trees. But it doesn't look like a forest, does it? Heck, you know, it doesn't look like anything. <laughs> it looks like a normal burial ground to me, but just a little bit of a different design. Um, so, you know. I mean, I know crematoria have big problems with human remains and the pollution aspects, both the air, air pollution and the soil, soil making sure um, they are well distributed uh, and, and so on. So, um, wow, we've well, got through a lot of comments and a lot of questions about natural burial, about Vikings, about the Franks casket, about Ertzi, of which I really didn't have much to say, sorry, about this, this crazy um, thing you're telling me about um, the, these, these, these caskets that I need to look up. Uh, and I've taken a note of those. Um, so, you know, there's lots of things we've covered. I don't know if anyone has any further questions for me. Oh, yes, you agree about Queen Emma. She is has good intuition. Yes, yes. Vikings Valhalla. She's one of the best characters in it, I think. And, uh, um, you know, I think there's like, but, you know, the whole problem for me is they're trying to dramatise historical characters. I wish they just didn't bother, you know, and just created people called Sven and Edward or something. And they just just try Don't Don't pretend it actually happened. It's it's too confusing for people for early times. I'd love to see Sky Burial, but we sadly lack vultures in the UK. We should import the vultures. There's some at Chester Zoo. I mean, maybe it's another spinner for zoological gardens to get some sky burial options going. I know you can scatter your ashes, you know, at a, at a certain zoological gardens, and but perhaps we should set that up as an idea. Maybe we need to create a business model and promote sky burial. And you're helping the endangered species at the zoo. God, you know, I'm in the long, wrong line of work, really. I could be, I should be in the funerary industry. I could be the first vulture, authentic vulture sky burial site in the UK. Imagine that. We could call it something like um, um, Vulture Mortuary Culture or something and, 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 and do look at a logo of a sort of bird going, Arr! and a skeleton, Arr! and it'd be really good. <laughs> I've got to find a money spinner on something in my life, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. Diversification. Your grandfather's name was Sven. Well, it's good. 
I always use it as a generic Scandinavian name. I'm sorry. Sven is my John or whatever, or Brian or something. Uh, but Sven. <laughs> I mean, the Vikings and Vikings Valhalla. I mean, the thing I'm interested in is they have a lot of funerals, right? And season two has a lot, has like a, the Yom's Vikings are excarnating the dead on platform. So linking back to the point about Sky Burial, if you haven't watched Vikings Valhalla season two, the Yom's Vikings have a freaking valley of death, a death valley where they put the dead on these platforms. And it's, I don't know, there's any archaeological evidence for it. And it who cares whether they have it. It's a great idea. They th obviously thought had a meeting. Like, We've got to make the Yom's Vikings really mad. What are we going to do really mad? What's going to make them really they all wear a bone of their ancestors around their neck and they 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 basically have a death valley a secret death valley not just a public a proper secret death valley for the yom's vikings and then someone else in the room goes but why and you don't ask why because they've got to be weird all right and the yom's vikings are basically we find out their leader is a neo-nazi really and he doesn't like these filthy mixing with other Nordic tribes. So he's some kind of, he's a, and he, he gets a really satisfying end. So like all good Nazi deaths, you know, really horrible, you know, because he's a real nasty piece of work. Um, yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's, it does none of the plot really works and none of the scenes actually work, but it's, it's good. <laughs> um, um, it, but it is, it is, it is a, it has funerary content and that's why I'm interested in it because I don't think anyone's going to go around and go, ah, oh, is that what the Yom's Vikings actually did? Unless you're dumb, you know, but, you know, it's fun. It's an interesting take and they're showing very different and very weird early medieval societies. One of the things I'm going to talk about in my blogs is the way of weird and the symbol of weird, which is a modern symbol to do with pagans and this idea of the fates weaving on the loom, the Norns the um, weaving on the loom and they've taken it and stuck it in the 11th century as if it was an ancient pagan symbol and that's going to confuse a lot of people I think so I've done a talked about that in the blog post and said it's all it's all modern but it's cool that they used it and thought about it um but um it's it, uh, you know the problem is you know like all these shows with great power comes great responsibility they've got global reach lots of people are going to watch it and a lot of people are going to think Oh, you know, I don't actually believe that's what happened, but now I've internalised this idea that, you know, the Vikings went over rapids down the Dnieper and that Kiev disappeared in the 11th century. So that's one of the funniest things about the TV show, because since Russia really, you know, uh, attacked and invaded Ukraine, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, suddenly Kiev isn't included at all. So in Vikings, the Vikings TV show, Kiev is shown as a big city and a big focus of the loose and then suddenly in the 11th century it's not there anymore it's disappeared it's like erased off the planet so that was an interesting p political choice or uh you know and instead there's just Pachenex and the harold sigerson trying to ride the the rapids look basically going over the victoria falls you know in this uh, it's all crap but it's fun I'll, you'll have to wait and watch my te my my blog post about that. <laughs> it's it's all good fun, but at least it's getting. But for me, you see, it's an archaeologist. At least it's getting out there that there are these ancient peoples with really complex, weird, crazy burial rites, and I think that's better than nothing. Given that there's some TV shows and some films about early times, there's very few about early Middle Ages. When there is, there's just one funeral or just one scene where someone dies. You know. And you know, now at least we've got this diversity of different burial traditions and, 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 and mortuary cultures that people can go, did that ever happen? And you can go, no, but here's what actually happened, you know, so you can spin off it and sort of talk about what we actually know. Uh, hey, Fable, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. I, I have I've just moved off the tea and I'm on to wine. I finished up my Cern Abbas. I've drained his tea and I'm on to wine in a Jack Daniels glass. Don't ask why. It's just here now. This is vestiges of cheap little wine as usual. Anyway, so we've talked about a lot. Yeah, where did Kiev go? It just disappeared. It obviously was taken by aliens. Probably part of an ancient civilization that Graham Hancock's going to cook up. <laughs> it is season two. 
nonsense on Netflix. Uh, so, I'm going to have a look through my list of things I was going to rant to you about and see if there's anything else I want to rant to you about. Yeah, museum posts. I thought people would love my museum posts. They hate them. There's hardly any views of them. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I do little introductions with me saying what they are. And then I just show here's stuff in a case. And I thought people would see, wow, amazing objects. So I've just done one on the Staffordshire Hoard. I mean, this is this amazing 7th century treasure, you know, gold and garnet work. It's hardly getting any views. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong because I see other people's posts who just go, hey, guys, I'm here. Museum. Object. And they're like hundreds of thousands of views. And I... So I don't know. I, I know it's not there's no there's no rhyme or reason to any of it, is there really? But it just it just it just uh, I know I, I couldn't I couldn't resist that uh, uh, slightly pervy comment there, Arctic Harmonists. I do apologise. It is Philistines, yeah. It's culture, mate. No one wants culture. Culture. No, it's true. It's, you, you think like it's pearls before swine, not you, but you know, it's pearls before swine. I mean, it, it, literally, I'm not doing the content. I'm not. I'm showing a gallery. It's just re refurbished, showing one of the most nationally famous archaeological finds known to humankind. You know, the, the Staffordshire hoards. Millions of people queued to see it. Millions of people queued to see it in when it was first uh, first found outside Birmingham uh, Art Gallery. I was one of them. Oh, I was one of them. Queued for five hours. Five hours. That people coming from bloody Australia to queue to see the Staffordshire Horde. This is one of our and, and yeah, I show the TikTok of it and it's like ah oh, yeah. I think maybe it's just you know. I should just go to the camera. Stop what you're doing. This is amazing. And then people will go. Oh, is it? But you know, I, some I got you. Got to meet me a little way. You know, I can't. You know. Anyway, what can I do? Have you encountered Craig the tour guide? Yes, I could actually. Yes, of course. I follow, um, not Bethany. I can't remember her name now. Yes, with a, hello, I'm Craig, and I'm going to tell you about the Staffordshire Hall. I could do that, couldn't I? I should do more humour. <laughs> it might be the fact, Fable says it might be the fact that I'm in the museum. You'd rather I wasn't in the museum. I mean, you know, if I was rifling something from some illegal site, then I'd get all the views, probably. It's hard for many, especially indigenous, to want to engage in museum content. Well, that's true. I, I, I think there's a, a natural reluctance. Uh, um, but this stuff, when I'm actually showing things that are ethic, well, ethically sourced, if that's a phrase you can t for museums, stuff that has been recently found and evaluated and excavated and presented, that have no, it's not been pillaged or plundered from another part of the world, you'd think... This would be pretty cool. But, you know, I, I totally get what you mean. If I was, I certainly don't want to be part of the content going into museums and going, here's this amazing find and not talking about the ethical context of its history of use and abuse, you know. And I think, you know, I think you see some of that clickbait content that doesn't raise those issues. I certainly respect why people will be irked by that, but I certainly don't do that. I'm just reading the comments now. Oh, I see what you mean, Fable. I should just talk about the images and say, I, yeah, I mean, maybe that would be easier if it's more, you know, show and tell rather than here's the stuff. But I thought that's the dynamic to encourage people to go themselves so people sort of know what's there. That's what I think. Do some videos asking for the return of stolen indigenous artifacts. They have to trust you. OK. OK. So well, the problem is, for me, um, my expertise lies in mainly Britain and Scandinavia. And uh, so I don't really, given that there's so many complex ethical, legal and political issues, I think it's very easy to say something like, yeah, return the artifacts um, and, and not deal with a lot of the, the specific cult context. And I think that could be. I worry that would be best patronising and shallow and wouldn't actually 
really deal with the specific issue. So if I had knowledge of, say, the the Hydra and the Klingit, and I knew about their cultural artifacts and where they were in British museums, and I wanted to talk about that issue, then I would make that content. But I, that's not my area of archaeological specialism, say, of the northwest coast or something like that. You know, so I think it depends on that's part of my expertise, and I'm not going to, re, you know, do some shallow rehearsal of a. Of a, um, to perform a, a knowledge on something I don't really have that knowledge. I think there's actually some really interesting issues though. I mean, while I stay on that topic of repatriation within the UK, um, there's a lot of debate and there's long debates over you know many decades about why objects are in London and Edinburgh and Cardiff and Dublin for the uh, Republic of Ireland, you know, and and Belfast to some extent, um, and why they can't be in regional museums. So I think there's there's actually in internal British Isles, Britain and Ireland dynamics of repatriation, which I have addressed actually, um, about why are objects not in their local context. Um, and the Staffordshire Hall is a good example where they actually decided to share the, dis the permanent display of the finds between um, different locations, particularly between Stoke and Birmingham in the end for the major exhibition. So I think that's a really interesting point where that's a good example, a good practice of local museums sharing it with that. So it doesn't have to go to the BM. So the BM never got hold of it. But it's a good idea. You know, it's right. You know, I, I will address these issues when I feel I have an expertise and confidence to address them. But for the same reason, you'll see I don't do like content on new archaeological discoveries from East Africa because that would be misrepresenting my expertise. Yes, I can do it. And there's other people doing that on here. But it's not it's not my thing. So it's not because I don't think those issues are important. I do. There's lots of issues I think are important that I don't address on TikTok. And the reason I don't address them on TikTok is because I don't want to produce content on something where I don't actually I haven't actually done some research on of depth. I've done whole books. I, did, I've, I, I should say, sorry, you don't know this. I've actually done books addressing this issue of, of cultural repatriation of human remains, particularly. And... Um, but talking about it on TikTok can can lose a lot of nuance. And I, I don't want to... I've been reluctant to go down that route. But I've certainly been speaking out against the bone trade and arseholes on TikTok who are selling and promoting the sale of human remains. So I'm sure you have been vocal on aspects that do different, you know, dis disproportionately affect indigenous communities, um, including... Because most of these, or at least developing world communities, because most of these human remains originally are quite recent and are from India and China. So there's there's those kind of issues where I'm happy to talk about, where I have a way in. But I, in terms of museums, I don't know. I think I have to protect, you know, I don't want to be a, a, a TikTok colonialist in just plucking information and, and materials outside from across the world, outside of things I know about, and then talking about them as if I'm an expert. Does that make sense? I, I, I know... And that's probably not an adequate answer, but I, I just don't want to pretend to be an expert on things I'm not. Some, it's about having some kind of integrity. So I'd rather not perform a, yeah. But I do care about these issues and I've addressed these issues, but I don't, I've got, I just, I just I'm, what I will address and what I won't address is it's a difficult one. But like I've addressed an issue I didn't think I was going to address today. For example, I talked about my, my experiences of teaching trans students and, uh, and naming and... Uh, uh, you know uh, pronouns issues which is something I haven't addressed before and I I did today so you know I, I can't ne never say never I might I might address issues of repatriation but like some things are so obvious like I'm not an expert like Ellie Mackin Roberts has done videos on the Parthenon and marbles and why they should be repatriated to Athens you know because she actually studies them you know I don't actually study those objects I happen to have a mixture of set of views about this you know about different finds and whether they should be you know uh, but for me, I think, I think that's so, it's such a moribund argument. I, it's just, it's like, I, I can't be bothered. You know, it's just so, well, the academic community has long decided many of these objects should have long gone back. It's not about us. It's about politics. Very frustrating. <laughs> oh right oh very good Alastair I'll have to <laughs> the killmonger scene yes I'm frozen I'm sorry
I think it is better to go and see the exhibitions yourself, but I think it's also a lot of people can't get to places and I thought it'd be, well, yeah, it's like a lot of people can't, won't know where to go to read about stuff, but it's the video serves as an intermediate. I'll think about that. Thank you about the uh, duetting people who who do that content. Yes, I think I think so. Um, thank you. The Lewis chess pieces should go. Home. That, that's the kind of example I'm thinking. Yes, thank you, Coral. That's exactly the kind of example I'm talking about is where I do see that. I've talked about the Mould Cape, which is in the British Museum, which is from a town not far from me in North East Wales. And I think that should be in North Wales, personally. Um, and North East Wales, within Wales, has a series of stereotypes and derogatory attitudes towards it, let alone within the rest of the UK. And I think iconic finds like that, we should have some of that in our local museums. I just want to try and retain integrity in talking about the things I feel I've got a way into talking about. And, you know, there's a there's a balancing act. Like I would produce one video a month if I did proper research, you know, detailed research on it. And you know, none of us have time for that. And I don't want to equally just flip out a video in 10 seconds about every opinion and become like a like one of these backbench Tory MPs who's got a view on everything. You know, he's always in the Daily Mail saying, Andrew Bridgen says, you know, what culture, you know, or the equivalent of that where every, uh, and I, there are some academics on Twitter who've turned into that. They've turned into like every Ben in bronze and every artifact they've got a view on. Mentioning no names. <laughs> who could he be talking about there um and it's tiresome because sometimes they get it right and sometimes they know what they're shit and other times i go you know fuck all about what you're talking about shut the fuck up for a minute and let somebody an indigenous person a local curator a local community let them talk about this someone who's ne rather than someone who's never actually been to the countries involved in the repatriation Again, who could Howard be talking about? <laughs> You'll have to guess. You see, that's the thing. You know, and that's I, I see a lot of big creators turn into various versions of modern day colonialists. And they may be doing it with an anti-racist glaze or anti-racist sort of icing on the top of their 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 content cake, if you like. But really, they're just spewing out the same old guff. Here's a site in Egypt. Here's a site in Chile. Here's a site in Alaska. Oh, archaeologists have found stuff in Cambodia or where, you know, and you just go, fuck off. You know, just, just let someone else do content on on those areas. Don't try and no. Hmm. Who could I be talking about? Sorry, I'm being opinionated. You don't need to hear that. And that's that's the, what I don't want to do. You know, I know stuff. I've taught for 25 years about Roman Britain, early medieval Britain and Viking Age Scandinavia. And I don't get everything right, but at least I know stuff. You know, I can talk about that. Whereas I don't want to be on here. No gassing about the latest discoveries in Hungary and Uzbekistan. And I was at a conference recently, just before Christmas, actually, so this will interest you. I was at a conference recently where I was actually at an international conference with leading experts in the archaeology of Uzbekistan, <laughs> for example. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Um, and he's based in America, but he's German. And a really nice chat, chat. this crazy laugh. One of, those, one of those German laughs that goes on forever. <laughs> I don't know if you know what Germans are. Some, some, some German blokes have some really hilarious laughs. Anyway, um, I made him laugh a lot because they laugh at British people. English senses of humour, yeah? <laughs> um, it was really good fun. We had a good dynamic. Anyway, he works in Uzbekistan. And, you know, I learned sh loads of stuff from the guy. And, and, but then he works with Uzbeki, ar Uzbeki archaeologists, whatever the, the descriptor is. And he knows the stuff. So, yeah, at one level, he's part of that colonial model of Western archaeologists going to another country. But at least he knows about that particular situation. And at least he goes to the country to do fieldwork on a regular basis, as opposed to me. You know, like I could if, if, if a new piece of, say, uh, Californian indigenous rock art gets discovered, I could do a little TikTok. Going, yeah, but I can't talk about 
the detail of that, you'd need to talk to archaeologists that have worked in that part of California. And I think a news story is a news story. You can read the people are saying on here, or oh, you could go to the museum yourself. I don't want to be just regurgitating what BuzzFeed says or what Live Science says about a particular site. It's bullshit. Go and, what, go and read the magazines yourself. That's why I'm like, I, some of the breaking news, like on Roman decapitation, and I wanted to talk about. I don't really want to do it as a breaking news story or the Heathwood, because I'm in my latest book. Tessie Lerferman, who's the lead researcher of the new research on Repton Heathwood and finding evidence that basically the Vikings brought their dogs and horses with them. I, I'm interviewing her for my book. I, I want to start sort of doing a little 10 minute, no, 10 second. Oh, this is a research in 10 seconds. You know, it feels a bit wrong. You know, so I'm trying to all the time balance what I feel comfortable with. And I, I don't know. I don't always get it right. But, you know, it's good that people are asking me to do these things. That's what I want. That's, I appreciate that. I want people to demand information of me. But often I'm going to be selective because I've got a complex set of reasons in my head of going, do I really know enough about that? Once I think about I do. Do I want to share my view on that? Have I, you know, or maybe I do, maybe I don't. And then the, the ethics of, well, will I, will this be a, a constructive contribution to the debate? But are there books from you and have you only published papers? Oh, hi, Anne. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've got a a massive load of books. Yeah, I produced one monograph called Death and Memory in Early Medieval Britain. And I produced, I don't know how many I've done. Um, if you look at my Archeodeath uh, WordPress blog, right, I've got all my publications on there. So I've got, I don't even know how many books I've done. So I've done one monograph, right? And then I've done my latest books, two, uh, two edited books in 2022. Um, one in 2020, two in 2020. Uh two in 2019 so that's how many is that i've lost track already i've got about 12 books i think yeah one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven eleven edited books and one monograph and then i've edited a national journal the archaeological journal for six issues i edit my own journal and i produce papers and book chapters yeah so articles in journals and book chapters so yeah I've, I'm up to how many I don't even know how many I've done so I've got 47 journal articles my blog tells me because I don't know and I've done 73 book chapters or co-authored you know book chapters so I've got my yeah so I try and publish in different places and a few magazine articles and a few random you know little interim reports elsewhere but they're the, the core so I've got over 100 about 100 100 I can't even do you do the math. That's what they say in the States, isn't it? You do the math. But I've done, so I've done, I can't even add up anymore. It's the, it's the wine. I've done about 120, 120 articles and book chapters and then, you know, 11 edited books and a monograph. I've got plans for about four more monographs before I die. So I better hurry up, hadn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, um, you know, I hope to get, hope get, hope to get some of them out. Uh, too busy pissing around on TikTok, you know. Maybe I, maybe I can use Chat GB or whatever it's called, that that chatbot thing, to write my books for me now, so I can just spend my time drinking wine and sitting on TikTok. Yeah, Fable's right. So Fable knows what I'm talking about about the whole cult. You know, it's almost cultural appropriation, isn't it? And even if I'm talking about repatriation, it's still kind of cultural appropriation of the specific tribes or the specific peoples and their history of trying to bid for cultural um, for repatriation if I just treat repatriation as a single phenomenon. It's it's a kind of cultural appropriation in itself. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, that's that, you, you get what I mean. Was the trans student naming thing earlier because of recent events? Bad business that Okay, can I, I? I can talk about that Arctic harmonist. Yes. Okay, so a number of, no, not in recent events. I have over. I can't even remember the first time I had to deal with a student who, particularly when they came to university, either already had, was a trans individual and shared that with us, or was in the process. And we're increasingly getting individuals who. Coming to university is a moment when they confront this. And so we've, we have, it's been particularly prominent in the last three, four years, I've seen 
students changing i wish you know legally you know, legally or at least asking the university i don't know if it's legal and then or they're just asking the university to rename themselves for the purposes of their education and or issues where the individual is demonstrably in traditional terms of one gendered appearance but their name suggests an alternative and sometimes i'm privy to that information but often confidentiality you you know we don't always get a narrative you know and in every occasion as if frankly you know a student who gets married gets divorced or in other circumstances changes their name as an academic it's not my business to second guess that it's my business is to respect people and to attribute them the identity which they wish to be referred to it's not about me to decide this it's about me being common courtesy professional ethical conduct and not being a twat you know this is the basics you know that's what i was getting at and but, but also i was particularly motivated to make that post earlier about trans um about you know pronouns because i do get it wrong all the time but not, i don't get it wrong because i don't want to respect the pronouns because i can't remember even the student's name particularly in covid i can't remember some of those students i've hardly met apart from virtually and i can't even tell you what they look like sometimes and some of them are going well you remember we had this chat six to six months ago online and and i'm going oh you were that student who i talked to about that it's not about the pronouns it's about my lack of memory and that frustrates me and i'm i suppose so i have a frustration with my memory and also because the registers are online all the information's online i don't have a physical register anymore i often lose track of names faces and, and modules and so on okay so there's a whole frustration with me but also an awareness that i get so angry with myself when i do it when i have absolutely no intention of doing it mis, mis, misgendering or but you know it happens because you know i've even been in some but equally i must say the other reason that motivated me is some of the most socially engaged and supportive students during the strike action and during other recent issues that we faced as a department over the last two and a half years have been those students who are non-binary or trans. So I feel a great loyalty and love for those individuals because they, it's not because they're that way, but because they put a lot of effort into supporting us as academics and being vocal within our university. So I, I, on all those factors coming together and why I decided to, it spilled over into me doing a post today, actually. And it wasn't something I was going to talk about, but I just felt, I just thought to myself, do you know, I'm sick of this. You know, a lot of people see other creators and they think, oh, it's just someone sitting in a room on the internet. They, whatever their job is in daily life. I don't have any authority to speak on this. I am not a non-binary or trans person, but I think people should know that an academic who spent 25 years teaching only finds it mildly annoying because of their own inability to remember, right? The actual issue itself is no problem. I mean, I'm actively disinterested. I'm interested in the, the students learning, not in what shoes they're wearing or indeed what how they self-identify. Another level, I mean, when I say I don't care, I don't care in the sense of a positive, constructive lack of, I don't want to give attention to it. I don't want to give oxygen to it. I want to give them the respect and time to to deal with their issues and then as a personal tutor i often have to hear those personal informations uh, in detail but only sometimes so some students don't share and others do share so i'm aware i'm only seeing a tiny bit of the trouble they're going through the turmoil they're facing the financial the emotional the social the political also and i think there's an onus on me to shut the fuck up about these matters but also to say to others who think that the teaching profession are just full of people going, yeah, yeah, let's encourage, let's call everyone cis and Lester. I think there's so much nonsense out there and the culture wars mentality. They so little understanding of what happens in a classroom that genuinely, I think some people do believe that we are spending our time pushing an ideology or, you know, being indoctrinated or being repressed and forced to say these things that we don't want to say. And, in the end of the day, on a practical, that's what I thought I'd do it as a practical daily basis. It's bullshit. No, no one's spending time. I, no, of all the things I've got to do in my life, I haven't had a single meeting where we've all discussed this complex issue. You know, no one gives a shit in a good way. You know, we were trying to get on. You know, we're looking after and respecting the students and helping them with their learning. That's our job, right? And occasionally, if I miss, I misgender, 
someone's accused me today and the kind of, oh, I bet, bet you upset their fragile egos. How, how do I tell if I've upset a fragile ego? I've had a few, I, yeah, in my academic career, I've had people pitch complaints against me for things I've said. Like, I recently told off one of my students quite forcibly in, in a verbal manner about things. And I do that. I am not the most ch chummy character. Teachers are not your pe pals, right? I can be quite harsh, but not harsh about people's personal appearance, identity, harsh about their thinking. Uh, and I won't, and I don't tolerate abuse and hatred and racism and you know, transphobia in my classes, and I push back against that, but not by attacking the individual who said it, but by making it, like, talking around the issue. But what I don't think people understand is, is, is that it's so far down our priority list of shit we've got to deal with that we are not indulging molly coddling and all these other kind of rhetoric terms used. We are trying to support people in very difficult circumstances in the same way that if a student comes in and says, my name is now Smith because I divorced that husband of mine after he beat me up or just because I didn't like him anymore. I will then be calling that person their new name. And there will be, if I didn't do that, what kind of arsehole would I be? And the same applies here. Yeah, it's as simple as that. It's not complicated. And that's why I wanted to just make the point that in a practical way, it's not an issue. It's not an issue. And I've, I've dealt with students, particularly in the last five, six years. And I feel very passionate about just not treating them differently. And that sounds, and I know you say, well, of course, people are different. But, you know, I mean, I don't treat people based on whatever category they fit into. And yes, because of that, I end up saying faux pas. Yes, I, I, I cannot share on here one of the most painfully cringeworthy. It was like something out of a 70s sitcom faux pas I did over ethnicity with someone and yet I can assure you and I would tell you I never intended it it was not even something that came into my mind I said the joke it was on an archaeological site to a student of a particular ethnicity walked away and I thought I froze I went oh god I used I didn't know but how I oh no can I just say and there's no way to go back you know I just made that joke that wasn't about that that was about something else but now I know it looks like this ha 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 ha, ha. you must think so badly of me ha I'm not a complete you know uh, you know there's no point we all make mistakes and the best we can do is just you know just apart from these moments where I just want to you know crawl into the nearest archaeological feature and push the sword gently over me and just hide you know we're not trying to do anything to offend people and I think there's genuinely a sense that um that's not the way it's going I think there's people out there who genuinely think higher education is some kind of other weird world and I, I, I where we're all almost creating this world we're somehow engineering it in some Machiavellian lefty way we're we're woking people. We're making people woke. They come to us, just innocent children, and we we convert them in some kind of lab. Um, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, you know. I'm, I, I, th I just want to peep. Tr I think it's. I, I felt it's a, a time to address it. That's 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 my little rant about that to provide context uh, for that. But I do get angry. I hear I hear the stories from trans students about how they get abuse and stuff, and I don't want to be part of that. And I want to support them. Flat sun theory. I like that idea. <laughs> I like the idea of flat sun theory. <laughs> Thank you, well dot. That's lovely. <laughs> I, like the, I love uh, it's got the visual of just a flat sun theory. I don't. I, I, I just can't wait to see that or hear that. That's fantastic. I'll read that. London centric. Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm way back. I have. I started ranting and I didn't start looking. For, but how can we get back back up people who can support? I think, um, yes, I mean, it's really frustrating. Actually, I don't know about about social media more generally. Uh, can I answer this question, this question by run it, running Red Doe about um, how can we back up people to support them on particular issues? You know, like, I don't feel I do it enough and support people on issues I fervently agree with, but perhaps people don't know. I'd, I think it's right to say how I do more duets of people who 
have voices on things you care about, but you don't feel you can address, address yourself. I think that's sometimes because they've turned duets off because they get so much abuse about it. But I think I should endeavour to do more of that. Yes, I think you're right. There's some great questions coming here. Ram has a great... The Royal Albert Memorial Museum in, in Exeter. Is that Ram? Wedge. Wedge is asking about Ram repatriation. Program. I bet they do, actually. I'll, I'll look that up if that's what Ram is referring to. Um, I used to be down there in Exeter, so I know Ram quite well, or I used to. OK, OK, I've got to answer this one. Have you any knowledge about the clinker boat found in a pub car park in Wirral? So this is a new story I haven't addressed this because this hasn't been about that. So it's almost like an urban myth. This is archaeology. Is it pseudo archaeology? Is it genuine? Right. There is a pub at Mel's on the tip of the Wirral Peninsula in England, an area that is historically known to have Viking activity and Viking settlement from place names, archaeology, sculpture. We know that there were Hiberno North settlers around the Wirral Peninsula, right, or on the Dee and the uh, Mersey rivers that go into the Irish Sea. And there's a pub there where, was it in the 20s or 30s, they dug and they found what thought subsequently they think is a, a, a Viking clinker built vessel. And there's a new project supported by Stephen Harding of Nottingham University to dig probe. Uh, and rediscover this burial of the Viking ship, which could be sealed and preserved like the Ossebeer and Gopstack ship beneath clay. I don't know what to make of this. I, it's, it's, it, if it's true, it'd be amazing. I just kind of, it just, it just screams bullshit. <laughs> just, just another way of saying it. I just don't believe it. And maybe that's me being a stuffy academic. I, I'd love it to be true. I'd love them to find a Viking era clink a ship on the Wirral why not but I kind of pub you know ship beneath a pub I, I kind of but then who would have thought they would have found a, a an English king beneath a car park in Leicester yeah I don't know I, I don't know enough about the methodology that they're adopting uh, to investigate this site but maybe they'll find it maybe I'll be eating my hat or eating my German boo helmet if that's it there it is up there I shall move my camera so you can see it I've got a lot of my stuff for download, uh, so you can find most of my stuff is on my Academia Edu page um, and my and my Humanities Commons page, all from my link tree. I've tried to be as digitally open access as possible. Most of my latest books are ebooks. Can I just jump back to this point about Arctic Harm Assist? I'm sorry I'm a bit behind about whether our registry allows us to append. Now, I don't want to, I can't, I've got to be careful what I say about my university and British universities. They're already watching me for what I say in public about them. What I would say is that I think universities generally struggle to keep up. And when you have the records changed, and often this is students themselves don't always or didn't or don't always um, um, update their records whether it's about their disability or any other aspect of their identity I think the problem for me is that, that matching up in the room with the names on the forms with the identities and I think that there's more we need to have like social media you know so if people want to identify their pronouns to help others that we have this clearly on a form they them they and we don't have that at the moment so i've got a personal record of my two t's that are they them and I, tr I try to remember that but when i see them in some classes i might forget you know and i'll say oh yeah she's got a good point is that the end of the world for me is it the end of the world for them no all they say is that they most when when they tell me they just say no i appreciate you asking or appreciate you apologizing you know um yeah, most people forget and say that she or he, but I appreciate you trying. And they just like the fact 
they're being treated as a person <laughs> rather than as a problem. That's my sense of things. I, and I think as long as we're trying, I, but I think the university registry systems could be better to allow this to be clearer for individual academics who may only teach one student one module and may not know any of their backstory about their medical or personal background. Yeah, I agree with you. Lots of good points in here, but I don't think there's any ones I can either, either I don't understand or they're just additional. Oh, hello, Dr. David. Hello. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Arctic Harmacist, for confirming my sense of things. I have a question about archaeology. Oh, that's always good. Oh, oh, someone's to... People are having... <laughs> Yeah, people think we're it's all crying and basket weaving. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Yeah. So I went to uni in the 80s. The 80s were a fun time, easier. Can I come up to ask a question? Um, I don't know. I haven't really done much coming up to ask a question, um, but OK. Um, do, can you can you type a question or is it more of a verbal thing? I don't know about coming up. I haven't done much coming up stuff. Can you accept my request, please? Oh, God, where's, how does this work? Sorry, I'm always useless. Um, I'm always a question. And I'll, I'll just so I'm catching up. I want to ask you about the gender difference in skeletons, the percentage of demographic. Oh, I see why it's a more complicated question you're asking. Um, oh, right. OK, I'm sorry I was behind. I'm catching up with all the questions. OK, so you want to ask about the gender difference in skeletons and the percentage of demographics. OK, so um, which period? And, and, and I should have. OK, OK, I'm going to I am going to get you up. Sorry. Yes, I think it's best if you. If you get that up, sorry, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm finding how to do this. Yeah, hello. Right, OK, um, invitation has been sent out, so hopefully you can come on and ask me. Yes, hello. <laughs> Good morning. So hello. My, my questions um, are rooted in, so I uh, advocate for trans rights, OK? And so I explain the biology and the neurobiology behind why there is gender dysphoria or why a person would like to transition. So some of the questions that I get that I don't clearly have an answer for is, well, if you dig up a person, if you dig up a skeleton, you can say it's male or female. Now, I have tried to explain that uh, because I read some articles which state that, okay, if you assume there's 50% male, 50% female, we have also then seen that there's a marked difference between the genders in terms of assigning genders to them. So why is there a disconnect? That disconnect then shows that uh, the bimodality of male and female has not been updated in archaeology, and therefore they, quote-unquote, others um, are a possibly intersex or trans. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, okay. I think I think you I think you know what you're talking about, really, is my assurance. Um, um, I, I actually did a series of TikTok videos and a YouTube about this, which tries to go through some of the issues. There is a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot of, I would say, some silly short shortcut takes that don't, I think, cause more confusion, if I may say so, by people sort of saying, oh, wow, well, there was no, you know, the problem is there's a whole series of layers. You've got to think of it as a layered cake of methodological and theoretical problems with interpreting biological sex in the archaeological record and we start with preservation we then move on to the biases of um, which bits of bone survive and can be the different degrees of likelihood that we can ascribe a male or female sex estimation and then we've got the uh, the next layer i suppose would be the um the, the 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 criteria that we set and the populations we're using it against so for, i'll give you a very very crude example um when i when i was a student um i i'm not an expert in bioarchaeology right but I'm, I'm just giving you an example from when i was a student we were doing work on british early medieval skeletal material which are therefore in modern terminology would be white european ancestors right but our comparative collection our comparative skeleton was like many comparative skeletons sourced in east asia right and you can mm -hmm. imagine that the stature and robusticity 
of those individuals is very different. And therefore, when as a student, I was just trying to work out what when a lot of the criteria for what outside of the, the pelvis and the skull that are used to determine a male is about robusticity. And I've got a, a, a theme of what I think is from the pelvis shape, a demonstrably female individual. But in terms of robusticity on a Western European early medieval skeleton is so much more robust than my comparative male uh, East yeah. Asian source modern, you know, skeleton. Um, I, sorry, I don't know if that makes sense. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's so many biases in those even those you know macroscopic let alone the microscopic analysis to determine those sex so you have that then you have how the bet person was treated in death which is a cultural social phenomenon of of treatment and you're into realms where of course we're not for an individual burial everyone's on a, on, on on a degree of probability no one is male categorically or female categorically in terms of their sex or gender in the archaeological record all we're doing is estimating on probabilities based on criteria that are crude and population level so of course it's there are many people that if we took if people were just skeletons now and we were able to estimate we'd get it wrong all the time we'd broadly be able to tell which ones are males and which ones are females and therefore make a guess that they lived out their lives in those ways but that wouldn't deny that wouldn't you know doesn't cancel out the complexity of those that sit in different had different journeys and different life experiences and different uh, uh, you know self-identifications so i'm, I'm so I, what, I, what i try to do in those videos is to make the point that just because it looks hard sciencey and it looks like archaeologists have the answers you know, we're working with skeletal material without the flesh, without the, you know, and we're trying to make population level estimates only. Right. So uh, what I have come to understand is there are two people assume that there is um, two bell curves which are discrete for male and female. But my understanding is that it actually overlaps. And therefore, you can get a male with wide hips and flat uh, and uh, um, a tilted pelvic bone, and and you could get a female with flatter pelvic bone and uh, uh, narrow hips that looks similar to a male uh, skeleton. Is that accurate? I mean, that's my. I mean, I'm again with the qualifier that I'm not a bioarchaeologist. That is that sounds fine to me. And you've got to remember that, as I said individual populations the age of death will make a difference to how they look right and right. you know there's so many i mean and, and most of the time you know the pelvis has been bashed around during excavation and we don't have a full pelvis so we have the pelvis as you know is three bones and we're trying to put it back together and there's a whole series of biases in there and then the skull may not be well preserved you know so yeah so when you look at any so if you're looking at a cemetery sample say a roman burial you know, of 200 burials were excavated in East London. And then you'll have, well, perhaps only 80% were preserved well enough to get a sex estimation. Of those, you probably, the from the sex, the, the, the osteological study, they'll produce, say, uh, 30 definite male, 30 probable male, 20 possible male, 50 indeterminate, and then the other way, you know, 25 possible ma female, uh, 45 probable female, and then maybe another 30 definite male, female. That doesn't mean that only, that doesn't mean that the population had lots of definite and people going around going, oh, I'm possibly female. No, that's just a, what we can see on the bones. That doesn't right. mean, and there may have been individuals that we think look definitely male, but may have lived a life. <laughs> that was other than that and vice versa but and many of those people that we can't determine may have looked completely of one you know within one gendered life course and so we we have this problem that people i think pop culture they look at archaeology they see this range and they either jump in two directions either say archaeologists can prove you're either a male or you're a female or the opposite yeah. is because we have a lot of uncertainty, people assume, ah, most people in the past weren't male or female, which is a completely, both perspectives are ludicrous. Both perspectives are simplifications and are silly. And the reality is, 
you know, in most societies that we know about where we have historical and archaeological sources, there is a bimodal sex determination that maps onto a gender organisation, but it's varied. It varies historically. And there's going to be lots of historical examples where people, where societies have third and fourth and other genders that shift within their life course that may have a biological component that may relate to people who sit within that space or may not you know that there may be you know maybe other criteria that define whether you enter that third gender space or fourth gender space or so on and, and so I suppose my problem as an archaeologist and not really an anthropologist is I try to assure people that there's nothing in the archaeological record that's negating modern society's conversations but there is a lot that can enrich and inform and put into context and i think <clears> the most <throat> malicious thing i've seen is people doing this whole science proves you wrong you know archaeologists yeah. and these are the people who don't give a shit what archaeologists find any other time they don't give a flying fart about any of our discoveries and suddenly they're rocking up using archaeology as just a blunt instrument to mock and abuse people and they're that's my feeling on the matter. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. That uh, affirms my belief uh, in what I understand of archaeology and the uh, problems in sampling, the problems in preservation, the problems in finding complete bones and so forth. And um, so what I have now researched is and found is that um, hormonal therapy like HRT actually changes bone regulation specifically and uh, bone density as well as the uh, difference in long bones. So trans women are similar to cis women in terms of their uh, bone structure and length. And um, some of whom, this has not been proven, this part has not been proven, some of whom actually shrink in height. And it's within the uh, within the margin of error, so um, it's not significant enough to make that stance. But uh, there are some women who actually shrink in size, similar to the shrinkage that's seen in osteoporosis. So um, I would I would then venture to know how on earth is an archaeologist or a or a uh, anthropologist supposed to know the hormonal difference and uh, figure it out whether that's a trans person I mean, or a cis person. No, I mean, I'm sorry, you you've cut out. I can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, I think we're experiencing the same problem at each end. Um, um, I agree. I think. on an individual skeleton with traditional methods we cannot make such a conclusive determination now the, the the new thing of course is that a dna ancient dna research is adding to this picture of course and we have some famous individual graves where the uh, ancient dna evidence is giving us a sex determination but remember that is another that needn't correlate with the osteology in, in every sense and so it's not a it has its own interpretive problem so we have to be aware that all of these are interpretations of data that's never going to be categorical and conclusive right and we don't even have studies which show the effect on the skeleton for intersex people so that's a whole another thing right by itself and uh, so there's a lot more to be said that needs to be researched in terms of skeletal structures uh, in terms of gender and sex i i'm sure you're right i just don't know enough about that that i i must admit but i would say that i would say that archaeologists as as always as with other scientific disciplines are working with established terminologies that are often lost and misused outside of their specialisms and we know that we see uh our we've got to be very careful the way we couch our research papers even those that are you know specialist studies because people are accessing them and manipulating them to support particular 
modern narratives. We have this on race. We have this on ancient sex identities. We have this on a range of areas. And I think archaeologists have to up their game in making sure that when we produce our research, we have we're explaining better what we are saying and what we're not saying because i think there's some really bad examples and i've 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 been i've been making enemies fast and loose because of my criticism of colleagues doing the press releases doing the research you know doing the academic papers and allowing their research to be taken off in really dumb directions because they mm -hmm. haven't explained and that's not patronising the general public, saying the public are too stupid. They're not. They're actually engaging with this research and really interested in this research. And it only shows the importance of the research we're doing. But I think often we're we're perhaps not helping the situation by sort of peddling some of these narratives. And it's not about supporting one particular individual's life choices. It's about trying to explain the limits of what we can say and trying to be honest about that. And, right. and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the sorry. problem of extrapolating from your sample set, from your limited data, I think is a problem in all uh, scientific fields and statistical analysis is not uh, necessarily even completed when they're doing uh, inter, um, uh, interpolation and uh, uh, use applying it to the gender population, but I guess that's a whole different other argument here. <laughs> and and yes, I mean, I think you know, I mean, we I've been discussing this. Uh, there's been a whole heated debate about this in Viking studies, for example, about to what extent can we talk about gender fluid vikings and so on and one of the interesting things i find about that is that no one is really doubting that from all our historical sources viking age scandinavia was a largely bimodal you know gendered i uh society but we also have a range of mythological and literary sources and some archaeological evidence suggesting there were rep ideas, concepts, and perhaps even <laughs> people who sat outside of that world, sat in very ritual specialist roles that were deliberately set up to sit outside of that 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 normativity, that 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 divine, and and and. Some people are really antagonistic towards that idea, even though the idea has been around. It's hardly a new idea. It's hardly been a new it's been discussed for about 30 years. And we can't prove it for any individual. We can't say this person identified in this way and we would understand this today as. But these debates have been long established and it doesn't mean that everybody was gender fluid. It just means that there were in past societies well established and recognized routes by which people could sit outside of those traditional conceptualizations yeah absolutely and th there's enough cultural ar artifacts and documentation which support that so yeah. in multiple cultures and they're yes. living yeah. living descendants of those ancestors in living yes in, it... in living cultures and yeah absolutely i agree with you i think and, and we know that one of the well, the biggest threats, I think, is to is this sense that, you know, back, well, in, at least in my research, is this tedious narrative. And it's not just about uh, sex and gender. It's about back in the day, i.e. sometime that didn't exist in the 1950s, everyone lived a happy, simple, normal life, despite all the threat of nuclear war and despite all the other things, you know, this because of this, this invented past, this, this constructed and the Vikings are co-opted into that. The Vikings, oh, it was a time where everything was simple, apart from the fact there was all the disease and all the starvation and all the death. And you know, it was all nice. Everyone was happy being what, you know, so, and, and that romanticized, valorized view of what is a man and what is a woman. And that is what we have to really careful to, to, to critique and deconstruct. And we can do that. Um, but equally, we've got to be careful about in our bid to do that. We've got to be careful. We don't create new myths that don't quite we don't have evidence for. So it's about having honest conversations rather than the bad faith conversations that so often take place. <laughs> I suppose I'm trying to sort of navigate those difficult waters. <laughs> Right. Um, so um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for entertaining my question. Uh, I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming up. And I'm sorry I took so long to see. <laughs> oh, no problem. Thank you. That's really cool. Uh, I've just been seeing so many questions and comments on here. 
I, I won't be able to keep up with all of these. God, I've been going on for two hours now. This is great. But I think uh, I might have to go. I'm on to the brandy now. Um, I'm just going to try and go back and see if there's any other questions. Or I think it's just a really healthy chat amongst people um, within the chat rather than anything I need to address. Unless Spiritual Squirrel Vox, did you notice anyone? Anyone's asked a really good question. I want to start to many things. People. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of really good comments. Minus as possible telepath. Yeah, I mean, this is this this stuff outside of my area. I I can't really talk about HRT at all or anything like that. You know that. I, I don't have that you know, that scientific knowledge. Uh, da, 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 da. What are your favourite archaeological experience throughout your career? Favorite archaeological experience, Lala. Lala. Is that Lala? Lala. Um, gosh, I've been asked about finds. Finds. Usually, I get asked about finds, but you've asked something different. What's my favorite archaeological experience? That's a different one, isn't it? From the usual, what? What's your favorite find? So I appreciate the way you frame that question. And yes, thanks, spiritual school vibes. Yes, thank you. And I really think that experience, what's an experience? Experience, I suppose, that would be really, really, really touching. Or it's when you feel that you've found something new, you've discovered something yourself, you've unveiled something. So I suppose the experience, oh, this sounds a bit egotistical, but the experience of getting your work published based on your archaeological findings, that whether people... I like it, read it, hate it, disagree with it. The experience of getting your work out there as not just an opinion, but an evidence-based interpretive argument grounded in an analysis. I think that's the most rewarding and best repeated experience I've had as an archaeologist, which began when I was a master's student in my first public, uh, in my first year of my PhD and continues. And there's still both a a terrible buzz and a stab of dread every time my publications come out um, about whether they'll be accepted, derided, mocked. And now people are writing book reviews and article reviews on Twitter, uh, which is horrible and terrifying. You know, that I, have you seen the latest article by Howard Williams in the journal? <laughs> uh, five points about what? Thread! Thread! Five seventy-eight points about why it is wrong, and, and then and you get this long, you know, or it hasn't been done to me, or I haven't been bothered to read it if there has. But you know that equivalent, and you go, holy cow, and that's terrifying. The 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 court of public academic opinion over your work, but but the joy is the amount of work and getting it right. You know, it's not necessarily the pulling back the soil and finding the object that's the moment. Is my point. The moment, the real wonderful experience is when that object, those objects, that context, the, a context that someone else excavated and you're interpreting the finds, when you're able to distill it into an interpretation. That's my answer. <laughs> Thanks, L Lala, um, if that's the right way of saying your name. And and, and that's a really... Um, um, Yes, 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 you, you understand what I'm saying. Right, okay, I'm just catching up on what you're saying. Yeah, good. So with the book I mentioned, this is the book... Oh, okay. All right. Okay, thank you, Arctic Harmacist. Cheerio. Upon saying that, do you have a favourite site you've excavated or somewhere you wish you could could have? Well, um, I keep changing my favourite site every time I do a different live, and I have been asked that one before. Um, I'm going to say at the moment i saw it on twitter today people were talking about roger white's new book on rocks at a roman city vericonium so i would say it's a local roman city ruins it's iconic ruins it was an influential roman city in terms of not only understanding roman britain but also the cultural imagination since the 19th century of what is roman britain Verico vericonium um, roman roxeter has been really important perhaps more than even roman london and roman st albans so i would say um Roxeter. I dug there when I was 16. My first archaeological dig. Roxeter with Roger White. So um, I like Roger. And despite the fact he, I don't think he liked me when I was a student and 16, I was incredibly insufferable. If you think I'm insufferable now, imagine me at 16. I was even more insufferable. So I'd say Roxeter Roman City is my answer to that, Lala. Thank you very much.
only connect, which is the highest achievement humans can aspire to be, says E.M. Forster. Good old E.M. Forster. Mm. On that point, if I may, I may bow out after my two hours and a bit. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, how do you... Oh, there's another question. How, how do I find out if my beach rock find was shaped by hand or natural forces? Local museum, mate, or local finds liaison officer. If you found something on a beach, take it... To, if you think it may be human-made, you could always take it to your local finds liaison officer. Look up the Port Atlantic... If you're in the UK or... Um, Go to the Port of Antiquity Scheme or other parts of the world, local museum. They may be able to help you identify a find. No, I'm not an old Norse person, Nan's 2020. Sorry, I don't really, I don't have any expert knowledge on Norse language skills or anything like that. It all sounds like Greek to me. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like Greek to me. Have a good evening and drink. Yes, thank you very much. You've been a really lovely audience. Thank you very much. And I, I know most of you have already gone now, but thank you. Thank you very much for listening in. I really appreciate your kind comments and, and the, the amount of brain going on here. A lot of critical thinking is wonderful. Um, it really is a joy. Um, so I'm going to do more lives. Maybe when I get to 44,000 or 45,000, I'll do another live. Diochen Val. And um, good night to everyone here and everyone who has been here. Don't have nightmares. Archeo death forever. And uh, get an archaeology book or watch some of my archaeo death uh, YouTube videos, um, TikToks, or my WordPress blog. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Oh, and thank you to Spiritual Squirrelbox for um, being the moderator. Take care, everyone. Follow Archeodeath on WordPress, or you'll never learn.